کنفرانس بین المللی ایران آزاد قیام برای تغییر رژیم 29 جوان 2018 this evening's panel discussion, uh, which I will chair with uh, my honourable colleague from Ireland, Senator Brian O'Donnell. I look forward to hearing the contributions of other speakers this, this evening and to hear what their views are about how we can bring about change in Iran. But let me say, just a couple of things to start off. Two issues are obvious for anybody observing and following the situation in Iran. Firstly, Iran stands at a critical juncture in its history. And secondly, the international community must take steps to address and counter the unacceptable behavior of the regime at home and its malign intervention in the region and further development of its ballistic missile program. Our allies in the region and in Europe and the USA all agree on this. However, so far, the European approach, including, I regret to say, that of my own government, to these serious threats posed by the regime in Tehran has been too timid and lack an essential ingredient, which is to recognize that Iran's people's desire for freedom and democracy. Europe and the UK government have been reluctant to think of the terms of regime change because, unfortunately, they naively fall for the regime propaganda that any talk of change is foreign intervention rather than the Iranian dream. So the European policy for more than a decade has been to appease the regime, hoping that political expediency will encourage the emergence of a reformer from within the regime. This misplaced illusion has had serious consequences for the region and for the Iranian people as we can see across the Middle East today, and as we hear of constant reports of executions or arrests of protesters and human rights defenders and activists in Iran. My friends, clearly a reversal of the current appeasement policy is needed in Europe. And I think that our cross-party presence at the gathering tomorrow from the UK Parliament will convey that message to EU leaders and our own governments. I believe Europe's appeasement policy must end in favor of a policy that backs a democratic aspirations of the Iranian people and recognizes that those who are responsible for serious human rights abuses and the restriction of free access by the Iranian people to the internet and other information must be held to account. I believe that such an approach has widespread support amongst not just my own colleagues in the UK Parliament, but in parliaments throughout the European Union. Uh, thank you, Roger. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm honoured to have been asked to co-chair this evening's um, deliberations uh, with uh, my esteemed colleague uh, from uh, the Parliament in the United Kingdom, the House of Commons, uh, Roger Godsiff. We are here uh, to discuss human rights, democracy and freedom. And I think it's poignant that uh, from the panel uh, which is here today, it spans across the entire political spectrum, and I think that has to be welcomed, as has been outlined by Roger. Uh, it's also representative of a variety of disciplines uh, gathered here in a demonstration of the common support which we all share for democracy and human rights in Iran. 
We will be hearing from women's rights activists, from prominent lawyers here this evening, uh, religious leaders uh, who each have a unique perspective on the issues that face Iran today. The wide consensus on the importance of supporting freedom, democracy, uh, the freedom of religion, the freedom of expression and assembly, human rights, the rule of law and gender equality in Iran is evident by the diversity of the speakers uh, on the panel here this evening. These fundamental and basic human rights are an in intrinsic element of all democracies across Europe and are taken for granted by all of us gathered here today. However, these rights must be provided and guaranteed to all our brothers and sisters across the world, regardless of nationality, gender, or belief. It's clear that the discontent of Iranians has been growing as protests and strikes have spread across the country this year since the end of December. What started out as a protest uh, um, regarding the rising prices in Mossad, the second largest city in Iran, turned into a more profound expression of frustration with the Iranian regime. This sparked a movement that has since penetrated all regions of the country, underlined with slogans such as, down with this dictator, and our enemy is right here that have become common, a common feature of those protests. Interesting, just a short few days ago, the capital city of Tehran experienced its largest government regime protest since 2012. These protests began, as I mentioned, due to the high, un high unemployment, rising uh, prices, and social inequality but they are now more profound, and they soon uh, after their initiation turned into a clear message of widespread support for democracy by the Iranian people themselves, who are demanding respect for their fundamental human rights. Clearly, the Iranian people are urgently seeking an end to the repressive regime, and we all are gathered here to fully support this call. And that is why so many of us have come here to Paris uh, to show our sol solidarity uh, to uh, the objectives uh, of Madame Rajavi uh, and uh, the resistance movement. Any meaningful change in Iran, however, must be supported by the Iranian people themselves. Uh, and it's clear from the demonstration that the origin uh, uh, is, is occurring uh, at, that, uh, at that juncture. In order to support the Iranian pe people's efforts, uh, it's important that, uh, as parliamentarians, we support that. And I and my colleagues in the Irish Senate, uh, Senator Harkin, who is here with me, uh, have tabled a motion calling uh, for uh, democracy, human rights, and the end of the violations inflicted by the regime uh, in Iran. Uh, and we are calling on our own government in Ireland, uh, but moreover, uh, governments across Europe and the European Union to stand steadfast against the oppression and the regime uh, in Iran. Because we all value human life, we all value, value freedom, we all value democracy, and we all value the rule of law. But in order to achieve those objectives in Iran, uh, the regime must be overturned. Uh, and that's why this conference uh, at this time is so important. And I'm delighted to see so many uh, parliamentarians, lawyers, academics, uh, and friends gathered here uh, in the United United cause uh, of peace, uh, human rights, uh, and democracy uh, in a wonderful, wonderful part of the world. Goromahikov. Thank you very much. I think it's important for understanding the last wave of protests in Iran to see it in a larger context and a, in a larger view. Uh, the regime, the Mullah regime in Iran, have violated every human rights, international convention, and ethical and morally behavior since it came to the power. It has systematically harassed, arrested, raped, tortured, and executed human beings based on their uh, religious belief, based on their ethnicity based on their political view, 
or just because of the criminal, they were in the way of the criminal act of the regime. So it's important to understand that this protest is not only about economy or something that have come recent. We've seen these waves of protests come throughout many years. The regime cannot, despite the crackdowns they have had every time, stop the protest and stop the freedom movement of the people of Iran. Because the people of Iran want some basic human rights, wants dignity in their life, and as long as this regime exists, that is not possible. I think another important uh, lesson to learn about this regime is that this is not a regime that can be moderated, can change in any way without disappearing. This is a rotten regime that have no right to exist. They cannot change without disappearing, and they will disappear very soon. And the second of, uh, my second point is that the struggle of freedom and dignity for people of Iran should be a struggle and a fight for every decent human being in the world. Because the, the, the awful treatment of people doesn't stop within the border of Iran when it comes to this regime. Many people think of Iran when it comes to export that the largest export articles of Iran are oil and gas and so on. But that's not the case. The largest export article of the Mullah regime in Iran is destabilizing the neighboring area, terrorism, and all sorts of crimes. We have seen this from uh, former Yugoslavia to Chechnya in recent years in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, where they are formerly in, their, in Latin America. They have also committed a number of terrorist attacks. Even here in, in France and in Paris, they have killed people. In Germany, in Mykonos, when they blew up a restaurant with the leaders of the Kurds. So this is an awful regime that is not only a threat for the human beings in Iran and the people of Iran. This is a regime that is a real threat to the peace of the whole world and to stabilization of the whole region. And I'm very proud to be here and to tell the people in Iran and people every place else that they are not fighting alone. There is a lot of us standing behind them and fighting for basic human rights. Thank you. And honorable colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you this evening for important, this very important discussion on what is happening in Iran and in the general region. And I'd particularly like to thank uh, the organizing committee, all the members of the NCRI, uh, and all of the volunteers and the people who were involved in organizing the whole weekend. Uh, and it is very positive to see so many different parliamentarians here from right across the political spectrum in each of their own countries, um, from Ireland, from the United Kingdom, Norway, Finland, Romania, Italy, Moldova, Australia, Malta. But particularly as the spokesperson uh, of my party, Fianna Fáil, in the Irish Senate, the finance spokesperson, and as such, just some of the points I want to make today relate to um, financial matters um, and the financial things that are going on in, in terms of what Iran is doing across the globe. Um, we must remember that the main beneficiaries uh, and the actual winners of the sanction relief provided to Iran uh, under the nuclear deal are businesses, entities and institutions um, under the control of the IRGC and the Supreme Leader. They're not benefiting the ordinary citizens of Iran, uh, many of whom should not be living in poverty, but are living in poverty because the wealth, and there is significant wealth in Iran, is controlled by so few. Secondly, let us not forget that the Iranian regime is misusing the international financial system to support terrorism and its malign intervention in the region. It is not the Iranian people who benefit when Iran is allowed access to the dollar, but it is the IRGC and its proxies across the Middle East. In Europe, we have been very late to recognize this, but it is happening. And let me just give you one example. On the 10th of May this year, the United States and the United Arab Emirates jointly took action to disrupt an extensive currency exchange network in Iran and the UAE that has procured and transferred millions in US dollar denominated bulk cash to Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Quads Force, known as the IRGC QF, to fund its malign activities and regional proxy groups. Five days later, 
the U.S. Department of the Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control announced that it is imposing sanctions on the governor and a senior official of the Central Bank of Iran for moving millions of dollars on behalf of the IRGCQF to Hezbollah. The EU cannot allow this to happen, to continue, just because they back or like the nuclear deal or it benefits some of its countries. We need every member state to be vigilant on the efforts of the regime. The EU must take a joint position, and I'm conscious, we must take a joint position and coordinated measures to prevent any possible misuse of the European financial system. One way could be to impose punitive measures on those Iranian regime officials and entities that are identified by the US and others as, to, as actively taking part in or facilitating the regime's support for terrorism, which we know is happening. And I do look forward, and I'm sure many of us look forward, to possibly being able to go to Tehran sometime soon when the regime is overthrown and democracy can flourish in Iran uh, and that region. Thank you all very much. Honourable ladies and gentlemen, uh, Iran has been a great country in the history, but when I look today at Iran, it's in a very sad state. And the reason is very obvious the government of Iran. And in fact, there is no moderate government in Iran. It's brutal government in whole. And if you look at any developed country, they have democracy, they have human rights, and they have freedom of press. That's all lacking in Iran. And in fact, when the sanctions ended, we thought there will be economic growth in Iran. But in a dictatorship, when there is huge corruption, and in Iran, revolutionary guards control the economy. There is no space for private initiative. In fact, you can't guarantee decent life living of the population in that kind of system. I think it's appropriate for the population in Iran to have a regime change. How can that take place? I think the only way is that the Iranian people takes the power in their own hands. It means that there must be a massive wave of people fighting, that people know that they cannot be destroyed. There must be a trust that people can win, and there must be a good spirit. But there has been all been a ro long road in Iran, and I think the change can take place quite soon. Now we have to ask what the Western governments, what the European Union, European governments can do. And I must say, we must support that change. It means we must encourage the Iranian people to take the power in their own hands. And what's important, we have uh, NCRI, that's a democratic opposition, opposition. That's important, the next government is democratic and the change is into the better. But then the question of economic sanctions is quite essential in today. And I must say, when the government of Iran will not protect its own population, but indeed is an enemy of the population, that's a good ground to put sanctions on Iran and try in that way also to push the human rights to be uh, introduced in the country. Thank you so much.